right? Um, so, so by, by, by grabbing those, we get, um, The, yeah, the, 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 the not x2, x3, yeah. Um, and finally, right, we can get our last two that are missing there um, in another group of four. Um, so that's, a, that's an x2, um, not x3. Right. So that um, I think is probably the simplest that you can get this particular um, circuit, the V4 output. So again, if we um, look at um, Yeah, just making a new circuit here. Um, new, new drawing here. So, um, so again, given an expression, if you want to do it as a circuit, These last two could have been could use an exclusive or uh, gate if we wanted to. And as some people did on five there, not x2, x3, uh, or x2, not x3. Um, this is really an exclusive or. But anyway, um, so you know, building the circuit from the um, expression is kind of a mechanical thing, right? So um, you can always do it. The same way, if you want to. So, so just have your inputs and get uh, not gates um, for everything out there. So that, so that you have um, access both to the uh, value and the the complement of it uh, that you can uh, build your circuit from to, to get the equivalent uh, expression. All right. Um, so in this case, um, it's a four gate because we just need the X one, or we need um, X three and not X four. That's supposed to be an and there. So you know we just need the X three. And the not of X four. Uh, and then our last two. Um, so the not of X two, X three. And the um, X two, not, not X three. Right. So that was Z4. Didn't have that one on there, but um, um, but I assume that oops, that most people can um, then let's go back and get this here. Um, So the, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the process of creating the circuit then is kind of that same mechanics for, for the rest of these, right? And so assuming that you get the same form, um, you'd be able to um, get the, the circuit correct. So D5 is pretty, make it even uh, 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 real simple here. Um, if I had it right here. Um, oh yeah, I mean, again, you know, you don't have to circle it, don't care. So in this case, really all you have to do is grab these four fours. Again, if the, 
assuming that the um, truth table is correct that I had here for this um, um, LCD circuit. So, um, so you can get those with one group of four there, you get the four corners, that reduces down just to two terms. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, here, you know, we're basically getting groups of eight to make it down to, uh, to, to get everything. So, so, so one here is the X one, one here is um, 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 the uh, X two, um, another one here, if you all these, that's the, um, um, uh, X4. Um, oh, that, that was the not X3, and then this is X4. And oh, and then, then yeah, you can get these here to get um, um, that's X2, right? Um, before you get the, the one or statement. All right. So yeah, one way that's um, um, kind of all that I was going to discuss on the problems at nine. Let me know if anybody had any questions about any particular one uh, that you might want to ask about. Um, Otherwise, although it's a little bit early and, and we kind of got the uh, late start because technical difficulties, but um, I think I'll go ahead and just take a few minutes again here uh, and get set up. Um, and we'll talk about the uh, problem, the, the next problem set and the materials uh, for it. So had some more things that I wanted to um, present on the um, um, next two chapters of our textbook here. So, all right, let, let's come back in a few minutes then. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, start again here. So um, before I get into talking about the next problem set here over the, the, the um, instruction set uh, materials here, um, I wanted to uh, try and keep this relatively brief. I know most people probably want to get and get to the uh, problem set and, and, and discuss that and get some hints on things uh, maybe. But um, um, in, in this chapter 12 and 13, um, we, we introduced a couple of things um, and, and there's, um, I'll, I'll point out, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna be running these example programs. So I, I occasionally throw up these example programs, you know, um, uh, if you're interested, I mean, I encourage you to, to get those and actually run them yourself, get them in a debugger, compile them and run them. Uh, but um, um, there's a couple of things. Um, so in these chapters, we are looking uh, at uh, Intel architecture versus ARM architecture. Uh, we've done some some comparisons before on that on, on previous chapters, but but we get into it more here. Um, but uh, let me so so for one thing, um, uh, you know, little Indian versus big Indian um, is mentioned in this chapter. Um, we begin ta talking about RISC versus CISC. Um, so reduced instruction set computers versus complex instruction set computers. Um, and the terms were introduced before, if you were paying attention to the textbook, but uh, but now we're beginning to kind of use them, especially when we're comparing um, x86 um, and ARM, right? So in general, the Intel uh, x86 platform is mostly considered um, a complex instruction set um, a complex instruction set. So it's a CISC, a complex instruction set computer. Right. Whereas ARM is kind of the canonical example of a reduced instruction set computer or the risk approach to building an instruction set in an architecture. Right. So, so I'll talk some more about those. But um, um, another kind of big difference is that um, 
Um, Intel uses what's known as Little Indian layout for um, 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 how it lays out uh, values for uh, different data types in memory, right? Whereas by default, ARM uses Big Indian, although um, something I didn't know until I'd read uh, this chapter in our textbook that um, um, there's actually a thing that you can set in order to, to flip it so you can use little or big Indian uh, with the standard ARM architecture. So, um, so, so I need to resist the, the, the urge to talk too much about this. I could talk about this for the rest of the, the night here, but uh, let me show you this program real quickly because I just want to illustrate two things that, that this shows. Um, so my computer is, is actually an Intel. So um, um, Intel um, uh, x86 and x86-64 architectures use little Indian style. So that means that the least significant byte is stored in the lowest address uh, and the most significant byte for uh, data types is going to be stored in the highest address. Okay, um, and that's true both for like uh, float data types um, and integer data types. Right. So let's kind of see what that means uh, real quickly. Um, so in this program, I'm going to kind of throw up a debugger here so we can kind of look at memory layout when we run this program. Um, but we've got I've got a structure here. Um, and uh, we've, we've got a bunch of different data in here. So ints are going to take uh, four bytes or 32 bits. So, so these are going to each take four bytes. Um, I use a union here. Um, um, so if you know what a union is in C and C++, um, um, I can refer to the, the values in this W, uh, kind of take it out as if it it's going to use the same, you know, so for a double uses 64 bits or eight bytes, right? Um, and uh, uh, this uses an unsigned int 64 for the two fields. It uses the same bits, the, the same 64 bits of memory, but I can just uh, interpret them either as a double or as an unsigned int. But, but, but so in that case, this W is going to just take uh, um, uh, eight bytes or 64 bits in memory for this data structure, right? Um, we've got a, a pointer here. So if you know how pointers work, this uses uh, a memory address. So, so a pointer is really just an address uh, uh, in memory that, that points to some piece of data somewhere in memory, right? So since this is a memory address and since I'm on a 64-bit architecture, this also is gonna take 64 bits or eight bytes here, right? Um, and then I've got an array of single characters. So each character, and there's only seven uh, here, right? Uh, no, sorry, um, um, this is an array of, uh, no, that's right. So, so this, this, this has seven characters, right? Um, each character takes one byte. So actually only seven bytes or 56 bits goes into this field um, and so on. So a short is just a half sized integer. So this only takes um, um, uh, two bytes instead of the, the regular four bytes for an integer. And we have another integer here, all right? Now we put some data in, into these, right, so we can see things. So let me, um, hopefully I'll remember the, the debug um, commands here. So, um, so let me set a break. So I'm just running a debugger. I'm just running in uh, Emacs, which um, is one of my go to kind of editors for doing stuff. Um, so let's say set a breakpoint uh, down here uh, at line 66. Right. Um, and then let's go ahead and run it. So that it'll go down and break at that point. Okay. So now um, just a little bit bigger. Um, so now we've defined the structure and I put some, some uh, called S and I put some data into it. So let's exa actually examine it in memory, all right? So um, um, the GNU debugger is pretty powerful, uh, if I can remember. So it allows me to actually examine the contents of memory. I want to examine um, 40 bytes of memory um, as hexadecimal values. Um, yeah, for the uh, array S, uh, sorry, the the, um, um, the structure S here that has all these values in it, right? 
So, um, um, Uh, um, have to remember what the, the format for that is. Just a second. Uh, I had this. Oh, yeah, I still have it up. Uh, before I, so to examine memory, we have to say number of bytes, format. Um, oh, in in unit. Okay. Uh, Um, it's Um, I can't remember that. Uh, da, 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 da. That's right. Um, so in this case, I mean, you know, we can access all the fields uh, of S, but 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 I really want to see the the the, the contents of it uh, laid out in memory. Um, 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 oh, I know what I'm doing. So so oh, um, I remember. So uh, in this case, um, what I really need to do is I, I really need to tell it the, the memory address that I'm trying to examine. Um, I guess right. That's what I, that's what I was forgetting. So oops, so if we so in this case, for example, um, uh, you know what this means is that um, the, the 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 structure the, the variable that we called S here 
um, um, I, I got the address of it, okay? So that's the actual address on my computer that uh, S starts at, right? So if you look at that carefully, that's probably, it should be 64 bits, although I think there's only 12 characters there. So it's probably just the first 48 bits. The other bits are probably zero or something like that. So uh, yeah, that's, okay, finally, that's what I was trying to do. So um, um, let's look at this carefully, okay? So basically, um, the first field that's in there is an integer. So that takes four bytes. So remember that these are all hexadecimal values, right? So, so since each, since I printed, displayed this as hexadecimal, um, uh, each one of these digits represents four bits. Um, and, and then each uh, two digits represents uh, eight bits or one byte, right? So we have one byte um, for each one of these. Um, and there's gonna be, uh, each row is gonna have eight bytes. All right, so the, these are the, the, the values in memory from 320, 321, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's, that's the first 64 bits or the first eight bytes of my uh, array S, okay? And those are gonna correspond to the first field, A, right? So notice that we stuffed 1, 1, um, 2, 1, uh, Uh, sorry, we stuff one 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 two one three one four into there. Okay, so here one one is the most significant bits, the most significant byte, down to one four is the least significant byte. Right. So so <laughs> um, as we just said, so so when you see it, so you can see that the uh, the, the first thirty two bits or the first four bytes um, have those values for a right the, the the one 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 two one three one four in hexadecimal. But you see that the most significant bit uh, byte ended up at um, the highest memory address, right? Um, and um, and that's what Little Indian is. So, or uh, conversely, the least significant byte is stored at the lowest address for Little Indian, right? So here, the least significant byte is one four, and that ends up at the lowest address. Three twenty is the lowest address among these. That's Little Indian. So if I did the same thing on an ARM architecture, uh, but using the standard, uh, it would use Big Indian, and you would see that it's laid out in memory for this integer. This is an integer, but it's laid out in memory um, as one 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 two one three one four, with the the most significant at the lowest address up to the least significant at the highest address. Right. So that's just a convention about how you lay, lay out the, uh, the, the bits or the bytes uh, of a data type like this, right? Um, so you get the uh, same kind of thing, for example, to the reason why I did this with the doubles, I just wanted to show the same thing happens for a double. So um, um, although again, I stuffed in a hexadecimal pattern, but if we printed out what the um, um, that was, it'll look kind of like garbage, but, but I mean, you know, but this, this is really kind of a floating point value in memory here um, that we called um, um, S, the, the field name was B. I, I can display it as a float by, by getting the F field here. So, so I mean, that, that was the float value uh, that this, you know, we, we talked about, you know, so it's using the, the, the IEEE standard floating point, right? So this bit pattern ended up having that value as a float number, okay? Um, but again, uh, if we look at the, the so, so the, the, the next field um, after the A was just a pad and we had zeros in there. So that's where these next four bytes came from. So the next eight bytes, so, so the six, the, the, a double is 64 bits. So the next eight bytes are these. And again, you can see, uh, even though we stuffed it in um, as 21, 22, 23, 24, up to 28. So the least significant um, byte of these eight bytes uh, ended up at the highest memory address through 28, all right? Um, all right, and then one final thing. Um, so there's a, a little bit about alignment um, of, of data in memory um, on, on, on boundaries, right? So if, if you, put data in memory that's not aligned on like a, 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 a 32 or 64 bit address boundary, it can, it can hurt performance a bit. Um, so it might take, 
you know, two clock cycles to fetch something because it'll, it'll only uh, normally fetch things aligned on boundaries. So what we mean by that, so, so we have an example of that in here as well. Um, so for example, um, a, a, the easiest is just for me to show uh, the, the last two fields here, okay? So the last two fields were a short E, so that, that takes two bytes, and then uh, int F, which takes four bytes, right? So there's, there's only six bytes total uh, on, on these last two. Um, and we put 51, 52 in E. So you can see that here, right? But notice um, that the, the 61, 62, 63, 64 happened here. It skipped over two bytes, okay? Uh, that was actually the C compiler doing that to, to align 32-bit um, values on addresses that are divisible by four, okay? So it didn't put the, uh, the field F right after the field E. So this is really just garbage in there. That, that was just values that were at, at these two memory addresses. Uh, so we didn't actually write over those. Right. Um, so it put the two bytes here, but it refused uh, when it made the structure to um, put the, the next four bytes for the F field right after it, because that would have made the F field be over um, uh, an aligned boundary here. So it would have started at a memory address 342, uh, which is not divisible by four, right, which our textbook talked about. So. Um, and that's often yeah, done by compilers like this to do that, to, to, to you know, uh, keep stuff um, aligned on boundaries. Otherwise, you know, you'll get performance problems um, if you just allow it to be laid out and, and cross um, boundaries like that. So. Um, And I mean, since I'm running stuff, I'm just going to run the other one here. We'll talk maybe, I don't know if we'll have a chance to, but we'll talk a little bit about um, function calls and things. So, you know, the, all the materials about the instruction set talked about different kinds of instructions, um, you know, including things for changing program flow control, like branches and things, but also for implementing uh, function calls or procedures in return. Um, so I just wanted to mention one or two things about this, about that as well. Um, so here we've got a little program uh, that has a recursive function. Um, so the main function calls factorial. Um, and um, um, factorial is written recursively, so um, um, it can call itself in order to, to calculate the factorial, right? Um, So we'll run it in the debugger again, um, and let's set a breakpoint here at line 58. Um, so here, when we call it, um, and we're about to call the factorial function here. Um, Again, I'm not certain I'll be able to remember. Um, um, all these things here, but um, uh, here I actually disassembled the main function. So here we can see some examples of the x86 uh, instruction set itself. So this is presumably the code that uh, the main function was compiled down into um, in x86 um, assembly, right? Um, so I can pick out a, a few things here. So yeah, we're about ready to, to do this. So um, it's gonna be doing some things uh, to set up in order to do the function call. And then presumably this should be the function call. Now that, that's probably the function call to the, to the C out function. Um, um, so here is probably the function call before um, um, to, to call the factorial function here, right? 
Um, but uh, a few things I'll point out. So, you know, it does some things to, to move some values. So it's, it's actually saving th some stuff on the function call stack here before it, it does the call, right? Uh, and our textbook talks about, you know, so call and return are the instructions that are used um, in the x86 assembly to um, um, implement function calls or, or to provide a mechanism so that higher level languages can, can um, uh, uh, do things with uh, um, uh, function calls and things. So, um, um, before I forget, so you know, we can let me just point out a few things about the instruction set that we might talk more about here in a bit. You know, so in general, most instructions for x86 uh, have two. Um, addresses, right? So, so you know, we, we talk about one, two, three address or zero address instruction sets, right? Um, and so, so, you know, x86 is a complex instruction set. So it does have some instructions that might have three or some that only have one, right? But you can see that most of these have two. So, so it has two different kinds of addresses. And most of these, the, the first address, um, or is it the second address? So the second address might be the implicit one where the value, so, so I think, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I think the second one um, is implicitly, so, so here, you know, we're going to be moving a value from here into that. Um, uh, and this represents like a register or something like that, right? Um, before we call um, our function here. So. Anyway, so, so let's 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 step into the factorial function. So now we're up in here. Um, so what I kind of wanted to just point out. So so let's look over here, right? So so you know, if you've never thought about how a computer works at this level, like like in order to implement function calls and things like that. So over here, and that's, that's my breakpoint. Where's my um, um, Here's my stat. Here's my function call stack. Okay, so uh, this is a um, representation of where we are um, in running this program. Okay, so whenever you do um, a call like this uh, on the instruction set, or whenever you call a function um, in our higher level language, right? So, so here we were calling the factorial function. So a couple of things have to happen. Um, um, so basically. Um, um, we're going to push the, the the return address onto the function call stack. So that's what one of the things that the call instruction does. So, so whatever the current um, program counter is, it, it pushes that somewhere onto the it, for every uh, process that's running. There's there's going to be a stack pointer, so it can push on the address so that when you get to the return statement, uh, you can return back. You know. Um, to the place where we called uh, the factorial function and continue ex executing code. Okay, so that's the most basic thing that a call and return does in an instruction set, right? So there has to be some idea of, of a stack pointer, um, and that is going to be uh, again set up by the operating system and by the compiler. Um, um, so, and, and, and the stack pointer is going to be in a register. Um, so in, in this environment, that's called SP. Um, so that should be holding the, the, the value of, of, of where the stack pointer is pointing at, where the things like the return uh, address is pushed onto it. So that um, uh, when you get to the return statement, it'll pop that off, restore that back to the program counter so that we can continue executing um, where we called the function from. Right. Um, now, the other thing, I don't know if I'll be successful on this, but the other thing, um, uh, if we look at the disassembly of the factorial function, um, So again, you know, if, if we look down in here, we can see 
the 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 calls to um, or the one call to the factorial. This is the factorial calling itself recursively, right? So so we get down to here, um, we, we end up calling factorial recursively, right? Um, and uh, notice, I mean, another thing I want to point out. So, so normally the, these call and return statements, uh, they don't uh, um, do everything that that the, that's needs needs to be done by the, the high level language. So in particular, whenever you def define local variables, these are also um, put. Uh, they're actually um, allocated on the function call stack like this. So this local variable in minus one result um, is somewhere on my function call stack. Um, it has to be on the stack because if you need, if you want to support recursion, um, I need to have multiple versions of this. So every time I re-enter the factorial function, I have to have a different version of this local variable, right? So that's why it has to be on the function call stack. So part of the stuff that's happening here um, is that it's actually moving um, and, and making room um, on the, the function call stack. And, and this is just done as part of the compilation of the C code uh, in order to you know, declare um, um, the, the, the memory necessary on the function call stack to hold this local variable, the n minus one result here, all right? Um, so I, I thought I'd just mention, and then and then again, when you um, um, before you return um, that stuff, um, um, some some of that you have to do by hand in order. You know, the high level language compiler is going to be doing that stuff. So it's going to be uh, pushing uh, some stuff onto the function call stack in order to uh, define local variables, um, and then when it's done, um, it'll be popping those off so that when you do the the return. The last thing on the stack is just the, the program counter so that the return will get the, the correct pro program counter to, to return back from that function call. Um, all right, so, you know, I just wanted to, to you know, mention a few things about that. I mean, there, there's more details in this that we could go into. Um, I mean, you know, we can find some of these, um, uh, the, the, the code here. So for example, um, um, so here we, we see that we're subtracting one. So presumably in the, the register EAX most likely has the value of N uh, here, which was the, uh, the, the parameter um, that was passed in. Um, so we're subtracting one from EAX here, uh, and the result uh, probably uh, implicitly goes back into EAX, right? Um, or, or maybe, or, or conversely, maybe uh, in is, is in a different register. Um, so, so we do the, the calculation here, and then we remove the new value after we do the subtraction uh, there. I'm not certain which one it is. I'd have to go back and look at it in more detail. So, um, here, I think that we're moving one in here to return that maybe, so, so that's, um, uh, part of for the return statement set up here. Um, anyway, so so yeah, let's. Uh, that was most of the stuff that I wanted to kind of show on these examples. So let's go ahead and um, um, I actually I think I'll break this up into three parts. So um, so yeah, I'm, I'm about ready to start talking about the the current problem set, uh, but but maybe we'll take a three or four minute um, uh, quick break again, and I'll set up for that. So all right. All right, um, so let's see uh, if there's 
anybody has questions or things about the problem set then. So I've got a couple of things that I kind of wanted to make to, to clarify. Um, so we'll discuss maybe all these questions here and then also uh, use that in order to jump into maybe some of the things on our chapter uh, 13 and uh, 14 here on the instruction sets that we should be looking at this week here. So start off with the, the first question um, ask you to um, to write the, the programs for these different kinds of, uh, of, of machines, instruction sets, um, where we give these to you, okay? So uh, before I go into that, um, so, um, you know, at its most basic, an instruction in a, com in, in a computer architecture um, consists of, the some some operation and then some operands okay so so some things that the operation is going to operate on okay so one of the most basic one of the most um, um, basic um, uh, things about um, the architecture is like the number of, of addresses the number of those operands that you're going to typically have in your instruction right so um so you can have like uh, uh, well um we'll talk about uh, you can have uh, zero but um, um um instruction sets many of them have uh, one two or three operand addresses right so typically um, um modern instruction sets uh, the, the the most common are the the, the two operand the, the two address Kind of instructions again. So uh, one address instruction sets uh, where there's just kind of one operand um, are, are kind of old. Um, so, so some original um, computing architectures like uh, the old 6502, which was one of the predecessors for the Intel x86 um, and, and others kind of of that era. So we're talking more like like 70s, uh, 80s uh, uh, architecture, CPU architectures. Um, so, so it was common to have one address architectures then, right? So, so the way those work um, is that um, there's an Im Im implicit accumulator. So, so normally for a one address instruction architecture, you've got just one register. And that's all you have. And then all the instructions um, are going to be doing something with that one ref register. So that register um, is the implied destination uh, and uh, of, of the addresses and, and a source. Okay. So, for example, for load M, that means uh, all these, the, the second one is supposed to represent an, a memory address. So, so there's a reference to some data in memory. Um, this is using uh, what's known as a uh, direct address in here. We'll talk about that. So that's part of some of the, 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 the questions here. Um, so basically like a load, whatever memory address is referenced, we get the data that's in that memory address and we load it into the accumulator, right? Store just works in the opposite direction. So whatever's in the accumulator, uh, goes out to the memory address, right? So then here though, uh, Still, we only have one address, but notice that uh, we're using the accumulator for two different things. So to do add, what we're implying is that we get the value in the accumulator, uh, fetch the value from um, the, the, the memory reference here, add that together, and the result goes back into the accumulator, all right? So, um, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, like lots of instructions, you, um, you really need to have two pieces of data, two, two operands. But then also you need to have somewhere to store it back into. So the result then has to go somewhere, right? Uh, so our textbook talks about that. Um, um, and then um, there's another possibility for like a fourth operand. So some instruction set architectures um, um, have an additional possibility of a fourth operand, which is a specification of the next instruction, the, 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 the location uh, of the next instruction, okay? But many instruction sets don't don't use like that. That there's an implicit uh, that 
whenever you execute an instruction that you just are going to execute the next instruction after that normally. So by, by incrementing the program counter, and like we talked about in our hypothetical machine um, problems that we've used in this class, that type of thing. So, so, so often, I mean, you know, three operands are, uh, or are you know, very commonly needed. So, so like for the add, subtract, multiply, and divide, for all of these, we kind of need three pieces of, of, of three places, you know, so, but, but for a one address architecture, we take care of that by the accumulator is implicitly one of the inputs for the operation. And then the other input comes from some memory address. And then also the accumulator is the target where the result of the operation is stored. Um, so for a two address instruction set architecture, um, um, you know, as the name implies, we normally would have two addresses. So, um, and you know, and, and once you have two address or three address systems, uh, at that at that point, you can uh, have more than just a single register, right? So, so you can't really specify like a, a, a register here. It doesn't make kind of sense for a one address system. So you got the implied accumulator, which is like a register. Here. And that's what we used um, for our hypothetical machine, basically. Um, but, but for this, um, 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 two addresses means that we normally, our instructions have two operands, right? And the operands can uh, be like a memory address or they can be some specification of a register uh, where our um, machines will have multiple registers usually. So for example, the Intel, uh, x86 architecture that, that you learn about um, in these two chapters um, has general purpose registers like named A, B, C, D. It has about 16 of those, right? Um, same for ARM. It has more, um, which, um, but, but yeah, our textbook talks about that. Um, so the, the, the format of these, I don't know, I think our textbook gave some examples of formats for like a two, um, and three, um, so yeah, one address. So you can follow this, the same kind of format here. Um, so for example, oh, and, and I mean, basically the first question, you, you need to do something similar to this. So I gave you an expression, uh, so you should be doing something similar to the, the figure 13.3 for this first one, right? So, um, So these are all supposed to be, again, I really should try and find a better uh, electronic version of this. So, so these are all supposed to be um, um, implementing the same high level expression here, right? So, so we're, we're loading A into either memory Y, or this might be like a register Y, right? So here, uh, notice you use the same, so one thing I didn't make it explicit in the question, maybe I should have, but they use the same kind of, um, assumption here. So the assumption is, is that like, like for the two address uh, format here, that uh, Y um, should be the um, implicit uh, target. Um, like, like for example, for sub. Uh, so so, 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 so um, from when you're doing the subtraction, Y and B are, are um, the operands that are going to be operated on. So you take Y and subtract whatever B refers to, right? But then also Y, the, the first operand is the implied uh, location where you're going to store the result, right? So here, when, when we load A um, and then we end up um, um, subtracting B, uh, so now Y has, has the result of A minus B. Um, and then we load B into, um, another location, like another register or another location in memory. 
um, and we end up multiplying D times E, and that gets put back into T. Um, Oh yeah, it's supposed to be a division. So I guess it's supposed to be A minus B divided by C plus D times E, right? So that's what they're trying to do here. So, um, so when they, they, they get D times E into their T uh, and then they add C to that, right? So, so here, um, if uh, multiplication takes higher order preferences so up for the first question, um, you know, you kind of have to maybe manipulate the order that you do the lower level kind of machine instructions in order to get the right um, calculation, right? So we had to multiply D and E first um, because it, uh, well, it's parenthesized, but, but multiplication should have higher precedence normally anyway, and then add C. Um, and then we can take the, the, the value in Y and divide it by that value in T to get our final value of, of, of Y. So, um, anyway, so, so one kind of um, clarification for that first one, do kind of use the same format here. So the first one should be the implicit um, location where the result gets stored into for the two address uh, format, right? Likewise, you know, so you can see the same thing for the three address format. Um, so if we want to do like a subtraction, um, we can, uh, so here, you know, we, we have the, the two things that we're going to operate on. And then we have a, a third operand, uh, which is going to hold the result for the instruction when we need it, right? Um, so here, you know, um, as you add more and more operands, things get more and more powerful. So this is more kind of higher level. So you, so you don't really need explicit moves um, and, and stores um, um, uh, when you have things like this, right? So we can just get the A minus B, put it into Y, do our multiplication, um, and then do the addition um, and, and, and do our division, get the result. Uh, back out into Y here, right. but, but yeah, try and keep the same order um, if you do it. So, so again, the 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 results, uh, the output operand is the first one, um, and the way our textbook shows it, and then the, uh, the the two input operands are the second and third uh, operand here. Um, and that just leaves um, like a zero address uh, machine to talk about, right? So, I mean, our textbook should describe it here, but um, let me um, um, Describe what happens. So, so this isn't common. I mean, I, I think some processors, specialized processors, you know, have been built that, that do this. So basically, in order to do a zero address um, architecture, you have to have an implied stack of values. Um, so, um, so most of these, um, Although notice, I mean, you know, as is kind of implied here, I mean, you still have to have at least uh, one or two operations that, uh, that that take an operand because you have to have some way to get values on and off the stack. But otherwise, so so mostly um, most of the, the actual operations besides things that move data in and out um, don't specify anything because you, the, there's an implied that you take the two top values off the stack. So, so add basically is gonna pop the two values off the stack, add them together and push that result back onto the stack, all right? So um, I don't know, I mean, yeah, the, the, the zero address one might be the most complicated three. So, so you might, you know, um, um, you might wanna try the two address or three address first, those should be relatively easy. And then do the one address using uh, only an accumulator 
um, and then um, uh, try this, right? Yeah, again, you have to be careful for all these uh, to, to write your um, um, sequence of instructions in, in, in the correct order so that you have, uh, you know, do the operations correctly. Okay. And, and again, you know, you should assume that multiplication has a higher order of precedence. So it's incorrect if you add A plus B and then multiply that times C. That's a different result than first multiplying B times C and then adding A here. All right, questions about that one? But yeah, that was mostly about the first few sections of the... Um, of the um, characteristics and functions uh, chapter here. So... Um, All right, um, let me, so one thing um, for the second problem, um, this one, you, you don't, uh, I'm gonna consider like C, D and E to be more open-ended and more for extra credit. So um, so again, the, 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 to, to get a full answer for these, um, um, could get a bit complex and I don't really want people to get into that. Um, I think, but you should try and, 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 and do A. Um, and if you, if you get A, um, get kind of an answer, get an idea for A, then um, um, most people ought to be able to work out um, um, how to do something to, to do like an addition um, operation, right? So, so the basic setup of this um, problem is that um, we have a real simple kind of machine, a two instruction machine, okay? So, um, um, and there's only, there's, a, there's only two instructions. So, so this is an example of, um, um, this is kind of like um, the, the, the same idea as um, a, a, a complete set of logic gates that we talked about, right? So can we build up um, all the operations that we need if we had an instruction set that only had these two types of instructions, like a, a subtract and a jump. Okay. Um, although this isn't this isn't a normal subtract like like we talk about here. So the way this subtract works um, is um, it subtracts the contents of location X from the accumulator. All right. So this is a one address architecture here. So we, we subtract, so we take the accumulator minus X and the result goes back in the accumulator and the result um, is stored in location X, all right? Um, and then jump is just a jump, that, that is kind of similar. So that just jumps the program counter to the um, location specified. Um, but yeah, to tell you the truth, for like the, the first one, A, um, and you mostly only have to try and get uh, kind of an answer to A, right? Uh, so, so basically doing a move of X to the accumulator and a move of uh, accumulator to X. So, so, so a load, I should call that a, a load uh, X in the accumulator and a store accumulator to some memory location X here. Right. Um, let me give a, a little bit more detail on example of that. So for example, if let's say the program counter currently is at address 1000, right? So, so here we are at, at address 1000. And let's say you've got one of those sub S um, um, to subtract. So here, remember, we've got one bit, so, you know, um, um, 
Let, let, let's do it uh, a little bit simpler. Um, like, um, so say our program counter is at, at one, and we're using three bits. So, um, um, so address one has a subtract uh, for address two here. And, and address two, Um, has some value in it, right? Uh, and let's say we're only using four bits here. So, so in that case, right? So the first bit represents the opcode. So, so zero would be the opcode for subtract, and then the other three bits would give the um, memory address. So in this case, if we're trying to subtract from um, two uh, in, in binary, that would be you know zero for the opcode and zero, 010 zero for the operand field, right? Whereas, you know, I don't know, we, we've got a value over here. We're just treating this as a, as a data value here um, for this example. So maybe we've got, um, three um, in binary is our data about. And of course we have to have a value in the accumulator, right? So maybe the accumulator has a five. Right. So the result of executing that um, should be to, um, um, from the description, should be to subtract the content of location X from the accumulator. Right, so we should end up subtracting, uh, you know, five messages. So, so, you know, in our pseudocode or, or kind of the um, um, notation that we've been using and our textbook uses, uh, basically the the AC should subtract the value for the specified in the operand, right? So, so, so that's gonna be you know, five minus three. And then that value gets stored back into the AC. So, so we'll get the two there. But also like, like we said for this sub S, um, it does two things. So, so it stores it not only back in the accumulator, but it takes that value And stores it back into the um, address of that uh, operand. I meant op to be operand here, right? So, so we get get the um, as well, right? The 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 basic thing that's being asked um, on on part A, and then really that's the that's the only one that I want most people to concentrate on is, is part A. So, so can you implement, um, let, let's start with a, um, um, a load. So, so, you know, so it's so a load. That should load the value from some memory referenced in X into the accumulator, right? Just from the, the, the subs uh, instruction, right? You don't really need the jump as, as a hint uh, for this, or for, even for B, you, you would need that um, if you talk about C, D, and E, but um, but uh, you really wouldn't need it for um, A here, right? So kind of as a hint to do that, um, for example, if you knew that the accumulator was zero, and you did the subtract of, of X, you would end up with the negative of X in the accumulator. So that would be kind of like a load, except it would be loading the negative of X, right? Um, but then kind of as another hand, if you should, if you, if you could, um, um, So if you if you had zero in the accumulator and could subtract the negative of x from the accumulator, that that would basically be doing like taking the negative of a value, right? So so if I had the, the negative 
uh, so I've had the negative value of whatever was originally an X somewhere. And I did a subs and, and I had zero in the accumulator and I did a subs. You'd end up with zero minus the negative and, you'd, and you would make it positive again, right? So um, that's probably all the hints I'll give on that. But, but by doing um, multiple kind of subs, uh, you can do things to manipulate that in order to get make make a value be zero in the accumulator um, and then you know uh, be able to get the negative of the value transferred and then be able to negate that to get it back to the original value that type of thing is what you're trying to do in order to implement the uh, load and store operations for a here um, for this part two so yeah that's kind of like a puzzle so um, like i said it you know um, um, I'm kind of mostly dropping B, C, D, and E. I'd, you should probably think about them, especially B once you get A, but I think most people ought to be able to get something that works for, for A there, kind of like the, the load in the store. So. Um, All right, so I don't know if anybody has any questions about that or not. Um, So this one, you know, this one you just need basically the, uh, the the tables at the end of 39. So this is specifically about the x86 instruction set um, and a couple of the flags and things. Um, so you know, when when you compare, uh, when you do a compare instruction, it subtracts. Uh, so, so again, you know. A, a, X86 is basically a two address um, kind of architecture. So when you compare, it subtracts the source operand from the desti destination operand. So um, consider, it, uh, um, again, I don't know if this is true, maybe I've got these backwards, but just, just, just um, assume that the first operand is gonna be the source operand and the second one is gonna be the destination operand for this uh, problem, right? So a compare would just be subtracting those and then bits would be set. So for example, um, if they're equal, the zero bit would be set to one. So, so only when they're equal would the zero, be, zero bit be set to one. But when they're not equal, you know, in that case, the source could be bigger than the destination um, or the source could be less smaller than the destination. So you would get, um, um, you wouldn't get a zero bit because the result wouldn't be zero in that case, but you get some other bits set. So anyway, some of these are relevant to be able to be used to figure out, um, um, you know, uh, which one is greater or which one is less or, or when the two values are equal. So. All right, um, we can find that table. I don't know if anybody needs that, uh, but um, that's basically um, talked about in the um, um, these things down in the uh, the operation types where it talks a little bit about the status flags um, and uh, the condition codes, which you need for that question, basically. So. Um, all right, and then the questions after that are kind of getting into then the addressing modes and stuff, but let me, um, let me see if, um, there's one or two other things maybe to mention about. Um, 
uh, the other content in chapter 13 here. Um, so, right, so there's a discussion about the different types of um, data types, right? So how you interpret the bit patterns of, of, of data. Uh, I mean, you can interpret the same bit pattern different ways, right? So different instructions are going to be interpreting the data in different ways. And, and then that's, and that's built in down at the hardware level. So that's why you've got, uh, for example, um, some instructions for doing floating point operations like floating point division and multiplication and things like that. Um, and those are different from, you know, you have a different set of, of operations for doing integer um, or, un, or, or sign integer using two's complement um, representation, right? Um, so yeah, it talks about some of the, the common data types. So, so uh, you know, um, integer um, formats, floating point formats, um, logical data, so, so uh, zero, one, boolean. So normally, um, most computer architectures don't um, try and pack, you know, so that you have like um, um, eight logical uh, data variables in a single byte, right? So it tends to just use a whole byte or a whole word, um, but just interpret a zero as a false and a one as true. So again, at the architecture level of the machine instruction set um, would do that for different logical uh, operations. So. Um, all right, and then, yeah, besides that, so, so I mean, the rest of our textbook will we'll have more of these where we're specifically comparing x86 architecture and ARM architecture, right? So um, this is kind of a, I don't know if it's exhaustive, but, but a, a list of kind of all of the different things that are built in to the x86 instruction set um, for uh, data types that, that are represented by and used by different operations. Um, um, so you got your signed and unsigned um, integers, Um, um, some things for pointers, memory addressing, um, and your floating point standards that we talked about, you know, and a few others. Right? Um, and this was where the, uh, the the alignment on Word was talked a little bit about in here, I think, in, in this section. Um, so yeah, I mean, x86, um, you know, kind of like it's talking about here, um, doesn't really, you know, will allow you if, if you did it. To get, so again, compilers will often um, um, do things in order to keep alignment, right? But, um, 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 uh, but if things aren't unaligned, it, it can cause some um, need need to do some multiple transfers on, on the bus. Um, so, so some inefficiencies. Whereas on the ARM, um, um, you can um, um, actually have the processor, you know, stop, you know, giving them uh, an, um, an abort signal if. Um, any kinds of uh, um, access is trying to do, you know, is trying to be done on unaligned uh, data, basically. So, although I guess you can turn that on and off, basically. So. Likewise, I already mentioned this when we talked about little Indian, big Indian. So, you know, um, x86 is basically little Indian. ARM by default is big Indian, but um, um, there's a, another bit you can flip, so you can actually make ARM processors run using little Indian um, um, interpretations of, of memory layout.
So we've kind of run across this concept before, you know, so there's also um, You can think of these different categories, you know, the main ones being things like getting data in and out of the processor, and then you've got your different kinds of um, um, data transformations, so um, arithmetic expressions, logical expressions, um, and then kind of control, flow of control things, um, some jumps um, and call statements, so, so transfer of control. Um, this, this is where it talks a little bit about call return statements and things like that. So yeah, I mean, besides um, um, uh, ands, ors, and nots for logical statements, also there's things like shifting, bit shifting, things like that, or common operations. So. And then here, you know, right, it's where it talks a little bit about what actually happened with like procedure call instructions. Um, in a computer architecture, right? And and yeah, you know, so as we were discussing, kind of a basic, you know, at the most basic, you have to have a function call stack, which is usually going to be that there's a register that contains the stack pointer. Uh, and then calls push on the, the current program counter before you change the program counter in order to uh, jump into the procedure that you're calling. And then the corresponding return statement um, um, will pop off the top of the stack pointer. Um, and so that basically gives you the program counter that you need to return to, right? So you have to put that value that you pop off the the stack pointer, the, um, the, the, the function call stack, you have to push that back into the program counter so that you can return back uh, and continue executing. Um, Uh, but oh, yeah, but um, but yeah, the section does go into more detail because you know it's a little bit more complicated than that because you also have to put um, all your local variables. So, so every every variable that's local to a function, so that's declared in a function, actually gets um, allocated onto the function call stack. So you have to have these, these frame pointers um, um, and man manipulate your function call stack. Um, um, to add those on and remove them as you are calling functions and returning back from functions. Um, oh yeah, here's here's where the description of um, what, for example, is actually done in the x86 when you do a call, right? So. Um, Um, including, yeah, right, pushing the, the, the program counter on there um, and uh, doing the, thing with the, the frame pointer. Um, and uh, so on. Um, so if we went back and looked at the disassembly, we could see similar things like this happening kind of in preparation for um, some, uh, function calls and stuff. Um, all right. So let's go on to the, the, the 14 then about instruction set addressing. So that's the, the remaining questions are kind of uh, more about the, the remaining two questions are, are about addressing modes. Um, I think probably probably question two is kind of maybe the most difficult, which is kind of why I um, uh, just want you guys to concentrate on A there. Um, 
I don't know. I, I don't. I, I hope that these last two aren't too difficult. Oh, three. Last three. The last three are all um, about uh, addressing modes and things. So. Um, so real quickly, you know, um, probably for all three of these, as long as you understand the basics of this figure, um, it should really help for, for all these last three. Um, so there's, there are different kinds of addressing modes, uh, and, and why are there different kinds of addressing modes? So, so the, the textbook um, talks about that, the reasons why, you know, you've got all these, um, you know, some of the basic ones being that, the amount of bits that you have available for an instruction is limited. So especially if you, if you want to have like two or three operand uh, instruction sets, um, I mean, that can end up having really long, um, uh, you know, really a large number of bits needed to hold, hold all those operands, right? So uh, there's a wide variety of different kinds of instruction of, 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 of addressing modes then um, in order to do different things, uh, alleviate some of those issues, that kind of stuff. So the most basic is like immediate. So in that case, it's not really an address. Uh, the, the bits in there are just interpreted as an actual value, right? So you've got your opcode, uh, and then bits um, that are going to be uh, used to operate on, like like maybe like like maybe a load, an immediate load. You know, you might just specify this. Think of that as like a constant value that you want to load into a register or something like that. So, um, so the most basic addressing modes are direct and indirect addressing. Right. So for direct, the, 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 the bits in the operand field are interpreted as a memory address um, in main memory. So in the computer architecture, we've got um, um, uh, an, a, a memory address space um, that we can go to to primary memory in order to, to get values, access values. So in this case, you know, um, whatever the memory address is, we would go out to memory, um, and that would we would get that value. So either, either you know, a store or a load, whichever way it's going. But um, um, that that value, whatever bits, um, those these these bits um, are interpreted as some memory address. Um, so we hit memory and, and get that value um, from the address that's indicated. So. Um, or indirect addressing. Um, so there's an extra level of, of, of access that's needed. So here we need to just do one memory access, right? Whether it's a read or a write. Right? And remember the, you know, so, so memory is a bottleneck. We talked a little bit about that in, in our class here. So, so um, if you don't have to do any accesses to, to external memory, um, I mean, that's good. Um, so, so the more access you have to go out to main memory, um, the, the worse your performance might be, right? So in this case, direct addressing requires one memory access, right? Um, of course, it might end up going to cache or something, but, um, but still. Um, so indirect, you actually have to do two memory um, addresses. So here, another thing that I kind of skipped over is that um, um, often, again, the operand fields are going to be limited, you know, so for like for, for a 64 bit um, architecture, you might only allow, say, 32 bits or 48 bits um, for the for a direct address. Right. So you might limit it a bit. So that's going to mean that um, you can't address the full memory. Um, Using direct addressing, if you if you don't have like you know the full bits that your memory arc your 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 instruction set architecture supports, right? So, um, 
one way you can kind of get around that is, is like an indirect addressing. So, so again, you might only have a limited number of bits, but by doing ind indirect addressing, you could have a full memory address or always have a full memory address for the indirect part of it. So th this kind of works like a pointer uh, in C basically. I mean, both of these are really kind of pointers because this is a memory address. So, so you, you follow one pointer to get the value that you want to operate on. But here we're going to be doing two, right? So, so this one gives you an initial, but then you're going to interpret that as further as a full memory address um, to get the actual operand for the indirect. Um, so, you know, because the amount of bits that we have for instructions can be very limiting. Um, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's very, um, so you want to use registers as much as possible, right? So um, as this talked about in this chapter here, um, so, so typically um, um, like in an x86 and ARM, there's a certain number of general purpose registers, right? So, so, uh, um, um, but, but there's a limited number of those, like 16 or 32, right? So um, if we have like eight registers, so, so normally those are gonna be uh, given reference by some number in, in the uh, instruction format, right? So if we have eight registers, we would only need three bits to specify which of the eight registers that we need. Right, or if we have sixteen registers, we just need four bits. Right, so that's very attractive. So, so that reduces greatly the number of bits, and then we can use, you know, the limited number of registers that we um, uh, specify using those three bits or four bits or five bits in order to um, to be able to access thirty-two separate registers. So kind of like, like when you have register addressing, I mean, that, that's kind of like doing um, um, the, the direct, right? Um, although here, again, another thing about registers is they're actually on the CPU. So they don't have the, the memory bottleneck, right? So, so you shouldn't consider this as a performance. You know, so, so, the, so the performance of a register reference is much faster than, than a normal direct memory reference. Right. Um, but then you have register indirect, so that um, allows you to do something like this. Uh, well, um, you know, so, so I mean, in some ways, it's like a direct. So, so here, here you know, we we um, um, interpret the values in the register as a memory address. The registers are usually going to have the full bits that the instruction set architecture has for the memory address space, right? So if it's a 64-bit architecture, the registers are gonna be 64 bits. So that means by, by doing register indirect, I can address all a memory um, by, by, by yeah, specifying which register holds the memory address that I wanna get the operand from. So. so that has some of the things I was talking about here, um, but, um, Oh, and again, though, this does require one actual memory reference. So, so we do have to hit the, the main memory um, for a register indirect to get our data value here. Um, and then display, there's actually, this is a very important category of memory addressing displacement. There's, there's lots of variations of this. So, um, relative addressing, base register addressing, indexing. Probably the easiest to understand is indexing, right? So, um, the way indexing works is that um, um, normally we've got two pieces of information. Um, uh, one is going to be interpreted as, uh, so, so usually the operand holds um, something that's interpreted as an address field, uh, and that's usually going to be the, um, uh, the base address of like an array. So, so indexing is, is, is used a lot 
to implement uh, accessing arrays, right? Uh, and then a second portion of the um, instruction is going to uh, specify a register that holds um, an index. So basically, you add the index to the base address of the array to get the actual address of the value that you want to access, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, lots of data processing is done by storing the stuff uh, as an array in memory. Um, and then we can iterate through the array by, you know, um, starting at the base address and starting at index zero. Um, and then um, um, uh, doing something with all the values in the array. So A at index zero, A at index one, A at index two, and so on, right? Um, and another thing about this that's, that's um, discussed here is that um, often for these kinds of uh, indexing and the others too, maybe, but um, especially for this, um, as a side effect, when you execute the instruction that's using um, 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 this kind of um, 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 indexing displacement addressing, it will auto increment the register so that you're set up to go to the next value in the array to process it, right? So. Um, so that's all really kind of the question four or five is, is you know, you just need to be familiar with the, the basic ones mostly, so immediate direct, indirect, um, um, register. So for example, um, we're implying here that um, um, we're doing immediate addressing uh, for A here, and that the, the operand has 20 on it, right? So immediate addressing, Um, is basically where we're interpreting the values as uh, an actual value instead of an address, right? Um, so here we're interpreting these as a value. So, so for this one and for five, um, you should kind of give me both the uh, the effective address and then the the, the value, right? So um, I'm, I, I mean, I guess I'm kind of getting away. There's really no effective address for immediate. And the value is just 20. But direct, um, so, so here we're interpreting this as a memory address instead of um, a value, right? So, so here, you know, um, we know uh, this is the con some, some contents of memory out here and what is actually in memory. So this is the address and, and the value that's in memory. Um, So for question five, you should interpret these as a 16-bit architecture. So, so uh, each one of these memory addresses holds uh, eight bits or one byte, right? So, so yeah, the, the bytes. Uh, so, so actually, the, the first two here uh, is one instruction, right? Where the first you know, five or six bits uh, uh, represent the app code, which is supposed to be a load here. Um, and then the next one, they'll represent the mode, right? So, so, um, so you have to answer what is the effective address um, and the, the value to be loaded into the accumulator um, if the mode um, specified by the bits, however many bits there are, might not even specify it, but if the, if the mode is indicating that we're doing an, a direct or an immediate or so on, right? Um, so there's some additional things in here. Um, If the mode is register, assume that when used that the source register is R1 and that register R1 has a value of 400. Um, but should, this should also say that uh, there, there, there is also a base register. So I should fix that. And so I didn't mean this. So, so there's also a base register that contains a value of 100. Um,
uh, oh, the base registers should be used in the um, um, uh, like the displacement and the auto indexing here um, modes. So. So for example, you know, use the base in the, the base uh, address, which has a value of 100 uh, to do the uh, uh, indexing displacement uh, that, we that I kind of talked about it in that same way for part H here, right? So, so that represents the base address of 100. Um, and then um, the register has a value of um, Um, 400 that you'd be using for your index, I guess, here. So. All right. And then, you know, there is a, a, another operand which came, contains the value 500, which will be used for some of these, like immediate and indirect. Um, we're basically using the uh, operand field of our 16-bit instruction here. Uh, um, the PC is currently set to 200 because that's the instruction that we're currently executing here. So PC relative would be relative to the current program counter. All right, and then, I don't know, I mean, hopefully it's clear then. So, you know, the actual value, if you calculate the effective address correctly, um, then you can use this information to figure out what the actual value is gonna be, right? So if your effective address is um, um, 400, um, it should have a value of 1,000. You know, effective address of 401 contains a value of 1,001 and so on. Um, all right, I don't know if anybody had any questions about that but there, if, for those people that are still with me here. Um, then finally, uh, the last one um, is also kind of about addressing, um, so here to clarify a few things about six, um, so you should interpret when there's parentheses around this, um, as um, the, a direct addressing mode, okay? So when you have parentheses around X, basically the, the kind of, X holds a, um, um, is, is a memory address. So you need to, to access the value in memory um, that's referred to here, right? So if, um, so again, to go back, um, I mean, it, it's the direct address, right? So if, um, if, if X is a thousand, uh, we're gonna go to memory address 1000 and that's gonna be whatever the value is at address thousand um, is, um, the operand we're going to use for the instruction, right? Then conversely, though, uh, without the parentheses, and we only do that once, but you, you consider that that should be direct. Just consider that a direct um, reference here. So if if the bits were a thousand, um, you would just be using the value of a thousand instead of interpreting that as a memory address to fetch an operand. Uh, and then the rest of these are kind of, again, kind of like a, a doing a similar pre-increment or, or post-increment. So, um, so, but, but here what you're incrementing is, um,
um, is the um, um, is the value of, of x itself. So, so that should increment um, uh, the actual value. So what that means basically is that um, if there's, if x has memory address 1000, like I've been using, after you do this, you know, after you um, resolve the effective address, um, uh, X is going to get end up being incremented to one thousand and one to, to the next word in memory. And then we'll just assume that uh, words uh, are you know, that we're manipulating single words here. So, so this increments to the next memory address by one, basically. Uh, so, so yeah, this should be a post increment. So you could, uh, um, resolve the effective address first, and then increment x, um, and then um, we had also a post decrement, same thing, but you would be decrementing x. Uh, we didn't have any pre increments, but uh, but yeah, pre -decre pre decrement means that you should first do the subtraction by one for x, then resolve the effective um, address. So. So yeah, I mean, if, if X holds a memory address, which you interpret as a stack pointer, um, um, some of these, Um, not all of these, but some of these would have the uh, effect. So think of the operation as being an add here. So some of these would have the effect of, um, so, so if X is pointing to the top of the stack, these would end up um, popping the, the top two values from the stack, adding them together. Um, and, and again, you should, you should infer that um, um, the effective address for the left operand is going to is the implicit destination for the result of the operation, right? So after that, if, if X is set correctly, uh, after you add the two values, um, um, it would end up storing it back into, you know, whatever the effective address is that X has here, right? Um, so, so for for a couple of these, I can't remember how many, but for a couple of these, the um, effect is as if you know, if you've got two values on top of the stack, it takes the top two values off the halves them together, and puts that result back onto the top of the stack with with the two ones that it used removed from the stack. So, right. And for some of these, the, the stack is growing towards zero, so, so it's growing um, 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 towards smaller addresses, and for, for um, others, it grows towards, towards the end of memory, towards bigger addresses. All right, um, I think that's enough hints on that. Hopefully that, um, um, Clarifies. Let's see, hopefully, that clarifies everything I was thinking about for um, this assignment. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if anybody had a final question or anything before I stop the session, let me know. Um, But um, otherwise, that's it. You know, if you have questions uh, after the fact, you know, keep emailing me about them, about this problem set. Um, yeah, and I hope you guys have a good rest of the evening then. I'll see you guys later.